We are on. Very good. Okay. Today we're going to conclude Nun, the verses of the letter Nun. And this will comprise two psukim, two verses of chapter or Psalm 119. We're going to learn verse 111 and 112. Nochalti eid voisecha. I have inherited your testimonies, intones King David. And this is not just any inheritance. This is li'olam. This is an eternal inheritance. Ki, because, sasoin libi hema. Because they are the rejoicing of my heart. I'm going to pose it that this verse makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. No sense. Why? Why? What do you mean, Nechalti et Vesecha? I have inherited your testimonies. Le'olo, forever. Not only inherited them, forever. The simple question is, every single Jew inherits the whole Torah. That's a basic Pasuk. <coughs> In fact, that is the very first thing a father is supposed to teach his son. That's what it says in the Gemara in Mesechet Sukkot. The first thing you teach your child is Torah Tzivalanu, Moshe. Moshe commanded us the Torah. This is Deuteronomy 33, the first, fourth verse, right in the beginning of the last parsha of the Torah. Morosha Kehilat Yaakov. It's an inheritance for the house of Jacob. David Melech has like discovered America here. Nachalti Ed Vesecha. I have inherited your testimonies. And not just inherited them, I inherited them la'ilam forever. And, and if David Melech would never say that he inherited the Torah and the mitzvahs, would it not be ours? What does it mean he inherited? And what does the joy of heart have to do with anything? How does the joy of heart create or make this inheritance eternal? I think this is a very foundational question. Rashi doesn't deal with it at all, and I don't know why. But the Mitzudah's David says, Nochalti, he says, Ani machzik. I hold fast, I hold fast to the Torah for eternity. Because I hold fast to it, therefore it is for me for an inheritance. Why? Because the mitzvahs, the instructions in it, they bring joy to my heart. I honestly don't know what this means. I, I, why does David Melech have to use the terminology of nachalti? Why does he have to say, I inherited? After all, this is not about inheritance. He should have said, Hechazakti ed veisecha. I held fast. Allah. Say, say, if that's what you want to say, you want to use the word machzik, you want to say you hold fast to it, then say that. Say you hold fast to it. Why are you invoking this imagery of an inheritance? And the reason is because the mitzvahs bring me joy. What does one have to do with the other? Rabbeinu David Kimchi, the Radak, he says, Nachalti ed veisecha, I suppose he's like, he's almost like touching on this question. Why does it say, why does it say uh, nachla? Why does it say inheritance? He says, kemo nachala. It's like a nachala. It's like an inheritance. In other words, ani machzik bohem, I hold fast to them, ki odom hamuchzak benachalaso. Like a person who has an inheritance. But what is added when we emphasize this idea of inheritance? I would actually suggest otherwise. I would suggest to you that if you're talking about hard work and, 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 and holding fast to something and grasping something and making something yours, it's anything but an inheritance. And there's an interesting statement in the Gemara that says that uh, the Torah is not an inheritance. The Hatayda Eini Yerushalach. How do we balance that with the words of the Torah that says Torah Yerushalach? It's a very good, good question. But Torah Eini Yerushalach. And the, the meaning of the Gemara is that you cannot expect it because your parents will learn it, you will be learned. Or by osmosis, I'll be a Tamil Chacham. 
There is no such thing. Nobody becomes wise or learned or educated by osmosis. You can learn some things. You can learn basics. You cannot become an educated person. You cannot become a Talmud Chacham. You cannot become a scholar unless you work really hard. About the Torah it is written, Yagaito Matsasa. Only if you toil. And then you maintain that you have found Matamen that's believable. The truth is that based on the teachings of the Rebbe Rashab, the Rebbe applies it broadly to all of Yiddishkeit endeavors. But specifically, the Gemara that says the Yagaito Matsasa, the Gemara there is talking about Torah study. Torah study requires Yigiyah. Torah study requires tremendous toil. And if David Melech wants to say that he held fast to the Torah, that he grasped the Torah, that he studied the Torah under any circumstances, well, in that case, he should have said, not nachalti, not, not inheritance, because inheritance is you don't have to work for. You know what you need to get an inheritance? Nothing. You have to be related. That's all. Nobody works for an inheritance. Inheritances come for free. And if David Melch wants to emphasize hard work, it would seem that the emphasis should not be on the word nachalti, on the idea of inheritance. So some, some of the Mepharshim say that this has something to do with keeping the Torah under the most difficult of circumstances. I actually don't remember where I saw this. One of the Mepharshim emphasizes that I saw somewhere in my sojourns here, that even under the, 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 the most trying of circumstances, the most difficult of circumstances, I nonetheless held fast to her, another faith, faith on the fire. Okay, if it's faith on the fire, it should be anything but inherited. So I'm, I'm posing this question. <laughs> that sounds very nice, Nechalti and Vesecha. What in heaven does that mean? It is interesting to note that the Ibn Ezra takes a totally different approach. The approach that, that, that I shared with you, which is the Mitsuda, the Mitsudais and the Radak, and the Meiri says something quite similar. It's a very similar thing. It's about inheritance. So the Ibn Ezra takes a different approach to this altogether. He says... It's almost like saying, the reason that, that I rejoice in this, I, I have this tradition of faith from my forefathers. The wonders are the miracles, the things you did for my forefathers, for my ancestors. In other words, that my inheritance of faith is based on what they witnessed. And, and he finishes, I rejoice as if, as if they happened to me, as if I would have been there. David Amalek says, I, said, I, I imagine to myself, I, I kind of try to live with the, their faith as if, as if their faith is my faith, as if their experiences were my experiences. So, so that's, that's an interesting approach. So that Ibn Ezra means to say, the David Melech said, I try to make theirs mine. Theirs mine is the idea of, of an inheritance. Of course, we know that the one who inherits actually is in the place of the inheritor. Mm -hmm. In fact, legally, from a Torah perspective, it doesn't work with this in Canada because they couldn't tax you if this would be the case. So the taxes are actually not legal according to Torah. But according to Torah, when you inherit something, it's not a transaction. It's not as if residuals change from jurisdiction A to jurisdiction B, which is the way Canadian tax law defines it allowing them to tax you. But from a Torah perspective, the jurisdiction is modified. The jurisdiction which was Avram, of, Avram owns this, now Yitzchak owns this. But not because the residuals have gone from the jurisdiction of Avram to the jurisdiction of Yitzchak, but rather the jurisdiction that was Avram is now Yitzchak. It's a modification of jurisdiction rather than a change of residuals to another jurisdiction. This is a very profound thing and, and something we could talk about, but it's not really that relevant. The point I'm trying to make here is uh, inheritance would mean, the toil of inheriting something would mean to make that mine. To make it mine. It's my inheritance, my thing. It's not just something they saw. It's not something they experienced. It's not something they knew. It's not something that they absorbed. I experienced it. I knew it. I absorbed it. And that really takes a tremendous amount of work. That's, that's, that's not a simple thing. I shared this with you before, but uh, Rabbi Shachar told me recently 
that uh, I asked him about his first Yechidus, first time he met the Rebbe. And he told me that he asked the Rebbe, how could he become a chassid? He was already a mature boy. I think he was 20 or 21. And he hadn't grown up in a Lubavitch family. And he wanted to know how to be a chassid. And the Rebbe told him three things. The first thing the Rebbe said to him was that he has to try to make the experiences of the things he learns to experience the things he learns. To experience the things he learns. In other words, that he has to see it as if Everything, everything he learns, everything he's aware of, as if he's actually experiencing it. <laughs> he, he told me the Rebbe said to him, you have to <coughs> focus <coughs> so much that when you say the words, in Davenik, that when you say the words, he brought his children through the Reed Sea, you should be surprised your feet are not wet. This is the Rebbe told him. Never didn't make jokes. They were told that that's, that's how profound you have to connect to the words of Yadavaning. That's how you have to experience the words of, of Torah that you study. And maybe, maybe this is the idea of Nechalti Yad Vesecha, as Ibn Ezra explains it. Maybe that, like, that's, that's the kind of thing that Ebu was telling him. Experience it. Make it yours. Personalize it. Make it real. Okay, but the Ibn Ezra is, is the lone ranger here in that approach. Everybody else seems to talk about this notion that David Melech held fast he made it an inheritance, and I'm asking you, what does that mean? I think it's a fair question. So let's take a look at the Chumash, actually, that I'm basing my whole question on. The Chumash says in Deuteronomy 33, verse 4, Moshe, a very famous verse, Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us the Torah, Morasha, it's an inheritance for the congregation of Jacob, for Kihilat Yaakov. Rashi says something quite astonishing here. Rashi says, Torah, Asher Tziva Lanu Moshe, the Torah, which Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us, by the way, Torah, the Gemara Makis tells us, is the numeric equivalent of 611. And that's because 611 of the commandments were given to us through Moshe. Two, which, which complete the 613, were given to us by God Himself. I am the Lord your God. So two are given by God Himself, 611 through Moshe. So Torah, the Torah, Asher Tziva, Lonu Moshe, Moroshahi, it's an inheritance for Lekihilat Yaakov. Rashi hasn't really said very much. <laughs> he adds one word. He takes the word Torah, Tziva, Lonu Moshe, Moroshah, and he adds the word Asher. And then he puts between the words Moroshah and Kihilat Yaakov, puts it, He, it is. And here Rashi says three words. Achaznuha we will, we will grasp it. We will not let go of it. What does that mean? How does that become the meaning of Morosha? Especially because Morosha, as, as the Rebbe used to always emphasize, was that the Torah, all of the Torah, the entirety of the Torah, belongs to every single Jew, even if he's an hour old. Because that's the nature of inheritance. You don't have to be learned, experienced, you don't have to be in any way in the know. You have to just be. If you are, you're an inheritor. So what does it mean? So the, the, the commentary on Rashi, Rabbeinu Aliyo Mizrahi says, we hold on to it, even Bishas Akzeris. Even at the time when there's decrees against us, we'll still hold on to it. What does that have to do with Morosha? What does that have to do with the notion of inheritance? So the Rebbe says something absolutely unbelievable. No other Mepharshim say this. Nobody explains this Rashi. I've never found a satisfying explanation for this Rashi other than what the Rebbe says. The Rebbe suggests that contrary to the natural approach that Rashi is talking about the word achzanuha, that comes from the word achiza, which means in Hebrew to grasp, Rashi is actually saying something different. He's saying something different. The Rebbe suggests the big Chiddush, this is a tremendous novelty, that the terminology of achzanuha does not come from the word achiza, but rather it comes from the word achuza. What is the... Ah, inheritance. In other words, an achuza, as it's understood in the framework of an inheritance, it's called an achuza. Now, of course, you're going to ask me, so what was Rashi telling us? Another word for inheritance? A rose by any other name is still a rose. What's the point of saying, not Yerusha, Achuza. Arusha and Achuza are the same thing. So the Rebbe says, take a look in the end of the book of Leviticus, in Parshat Bahar. 
Leviticus 25. Over there we read about certain kinds of inheritance. And one of the different forms of inheritance is talking about the land of Israel and specifically something which the Torah terms Sedei Achuza. Sedei Achuza means an ancestral homestead. An ancestral inheritance is talking about a piece of property. This is a sode, this is a field that a person would have inherited from their parents, from their ancestors. And what's unique about this Yerusha is that even if you sell this inheritance at the conclusion of 49 years of the agricultural cycle in Israel, at what we call the Yovel, the Jubilee, it is restored to its original owners. In other words, you can't really sell it. I mean, you can sell it, but it's not permanent. It's not what the Torah calls litzmitut. It is not an absolute sale. It is only temporary. You can temporarily unload your inheritance. It will boomerang back. It will return. And if you're not around, it'll return to your children. In other words, the Rebbe says, Achuza is different than Yerusha. Yerusha means something I inherit. Achuza means something which remains mine. There's a difference between an inheritance and an everlasting inheritance. Because inheritances, as a rule, are not everlasting. In fact, there's a joke that people make when they say that somebody is a waiter. Have you heard the expression? What do you do for a living? Is a waiter. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for his parents to die. <laughs> it's very sad, but yes, this is actually a real term, especially in the world of wills. So there are waiters. And then they say waiters become chemists. <laughs> Why did they become chemists? Because the gift of alchemy, at least the reverse gift of alchemy, seems to be given to these waiters. They inherit enormous sums, and somehow by the time they're finished, it's all spent. Mm. It's all spent. They turn money into mud. This is very common. <coughs> usually wealth does not last more than four generations in a family. By the fourth generation, the children are so privileged they're such fat cats. They're so, so entitled that they spend everything. And there's nothing left. The trust fund baby syndrome. Nothing left at the end. Spent it all. They're not frugal. They're not careful. They're not industrious. Money is nothing. You didn't work for it. It disappears. Spent flows through your fingers. Why? Because it was an inheritance. In other words, the reason the wealth won't remain is precisely because you didn't work for it inheritances by design do not last. They end up spent. But an achuza is different. The achuza, the inheritance that doesn't disappear, the gift that keeps giving, because even after you foolishly spend your inheritance, the fields will come back. So achuza is a very different kind of inheritance. And the Rebbe says... That the message of Marasha Kehilas Yaakov is not simply that it is an inheritance. It's an everlasting inheritance. It's an inheritance not only is it ours by birth, but it will come back to us. And every Jew must know that wherever he or she may roam, they can always come home because it is eternally ours. And the Torah is always yours for reclamation. And once we understand this Rashi, once we now understand and appreciate the terminology of achuza, now we can understand what Rashi means when he says, achzanu avaleina azvena. A yid will say, yeah, I got an inheritance. Where is it? I spent it. Why'd you do that? I was entitled. I was privileged. Why bother? I didn't work for it. The fact that the Torah is an inheritance can be a tremendous demerit, it would seem. Because if we don't have to work for it, if you don't have to earn it, maybe you won't retain it. Comes Rashi and says, Meirasha Kilos Yankov means Achzanua, Veloina Azvena. This is not the inheritance you spend. This is the inheritance that remains yours for posterity, for eternity. My dear friends, I would like to humbly suggest that the way the Rebbe explains the Rashi in Chumash Devarim is exactly how we can explain Pasuk Nachalti Ad Vesecha. Now let's return to the Mitzudas David. What is Rashi, what is the Mitzudas David saying? Think now with the Rebbe's amazing teaching in mind. 
אני מחזיק לעולם בתורה. When David המלך said no chalti, he meant achuza. I eternally grasp your Torah. V'hili l'nachalo. And it is mine as an inheritance, not something that I receive from my ancestors only, but something that I will pass on to my progeny and them to theirs. Look at Adak now. K'moi nachalahim li. It's a nachala. Sh'ani muhzak bahem. Ani muhzak. Ka'odom ha muhzak ben nachalasi, like a person who holds fast, a person who doesn't let the inheritance slip through his fingers. And here's something very interesting. By the way, the, the language in the Me'iri also lends itself to this interpretation. The Me'iri uses the words, he says, Nechalti ad ve'secha ka'odam ha'machazik benachalas ovois. Nachalas ovois. This is like this de'achuza. And why is that all? Kisos and libihema. So before I talk about the joy, which is an important p- component in this entire equation, I want to tell you, that it would, I would humbly like to suggest that to me it seems that the, uh, Rabbeinu Yitzchak Chiyun actually alludes to this. Because he says that David HaMelchir continues to describe how much he cherishes the Torah and its mitzvahs. Good morning, Zelda. I am fine, Baruch Hashem. I am busy. I'm Baruch Hashem, thank God, in the middle of teaching a Torah class. And so we're now broadcasting also live on Facebook. This is a good thing. It's a good thing. The Torah, the Torah Zelda, Zelda is ours for eternity and we should share it. We should share it freely with whoever is willing to listen because it's theirs too. And like, like an inheritance, you just have to claim it. It doesn't matter if you're on, today it doesn't matter. You can be on your computer and your cell phone and you could be watching this class or one of the other hundreds of thousands of classes and Torah lectures. You know what, Zelda? Not everybody can make it in person. I have had to adjust myself to having smaller crowds in attendance but knowing that there are people out there on Facebook and, and, um, and later on it has a life of its own. It gets recorded and, and that's edifying. So, so instead of, you know, instead of trying to, to fight the tsunami, which is really I- impossible and futile anyway, you may as well just embrace it and ride the wave. So if, if, if everybody's surfing the net, you surf too. Instead of bemoaning the fact that people don't come, and they don't, uh, let me tell you, they really, <laughs> they really don't anymore. Um, they're, 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 they're attending vicariously. They're, they're using technology, and this has enabled us to be able to teach Torah on a platform that is probably unprecedented, in human history. You, you just asked three different questions, Zelda. I have to take notes to remember all of your questions. But let me just say, firstly, it, it's, it's almost comical that you're asking me that question because you sit in a lonely room talking to a microphone. I know how lonely it is to be in the radio station. I've sat in your chair a number of times and at times sat across from you. Ah, so it isn't lonely at all because you know you have loyal listeners out there and even though the people aren't able to be seen by you, you still know they're there. So that's why I said it's funny you would ask that question. We both know that media is a tremendous tool, a huge convention, an envelope to be able to spread the message of goodness and of kindness, a message of wisdom and God consciousness. So no, of course it's not lonely. You're not lonely and neither am I. And we, we get the message out. Yes, that's, that's in response to your first question. What kind of feedback do I get? I'm going to tell you the feedback I get is actually extraordinary. I hear from people on six continents. People comment live. Uh, I, I've been to different places in the world and people will come to me and say, hey, by the way, I, I, I really enjoy uh, the classes that you're giving and I appreciate them. And yes, that is, is uh, it's edifying. I use the words of Jacob, v'hoyo ze schari. May that be my reward. There's no greater reward than knowing that you made a difference in somebody's life. And there's nothing really more fulfilling than being able to teach the Torah of Hashem and to inspire all kinds of people through its messages.
It's more like, it's more like I'm with you, Zelda. You've been doing this for much longer than me. <laughs> and for you, it's a real inheritance, as you got it from, from your dad, who had the vision to start Yiddish Radio here in Toronto, which is amazing. And we all know that this message goes far, far beyond Toronto and even Ontario. In fact, uh, we both know somebody in Australia who used to listen to your program and who was in touch with me and with you several times. So today the world has become a global village and Hashem has given us the technology. It's all about making good use of it. All of these things, Zelda, are but a tool and you can use them for good or chas v'shalom not. And, and our task, the mission that God has given us, especially in our time, is to utilize the gift of technology and its many wonderful possibilities in a good way because this is how we will change the world. And, you know, I, I was a teenager. I remember hearing the Rebbe say that when Mashiach will come, that they'll, they'll announce it on mass media. People will hear about it on the radio. And I don't think he meant radio any, any more or less than, than Facebook or Twitter. Uh, that was just using the language he had at the time. I, I think the year was 1988, and I remember it was Yom Tif when the Rebbe said this, and everybody walking out and asking the, uh, one of the police officers who was out in the street if Mashiach had come, did he hear anything on the radio? <laughs> but I, I don't think that's what the Rebbe meant. The, the Rebbe had a very clear vision of, of uh, media, mass media, social media, of technology being fully harnessed and utilized, and through it, we are empowered to change the world forever by spreading a message of goodliness and godliness that will accelerate and ultimately very speedily and in our time tip the scales and bring us an avalanche of knowledge of God as we'll all become saturated in higher consciousness, thusly experiencing peace, plenty, and prosperity. May that happen speedily and in our days. Amen. Right, that kind of like Load right in. <clears throat> so, um, the Rabbeinu Yitzchak Chiyun says that here, David HaMelech speaks about Chavivus, how much he cherishes the Torah, how much he loves the mitzvahs. And, and this is what he says. Listen, listen to the words of, of Rikhiyun and tell me if it's not so implicit after you hear everything that he says, Ka'odam hashomer al like a person who would take the responsibility to heart to watch over the inheritance that they got from their parents. He says, in other words, David Melech says, Ki balti I received the Torah, Alpi Mesorat Avot. It was passed down to me as an inheritance from previous generations. And therefore, Ba I will hold on to it. And I will not hand it to others. It's theirs too. I receive it as a gift and I pass it on to others in that same fashion. And here, the Rikhiyun <coughs> sends us off to a Pasuk in the Book of Kings, in the 21st chapter. And I'm convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I must be right in my interpretation, in my linking it to Rashi in Dvarim, because of what the Rikhiyun was a great Rishon, the Rebbe of the Abarbanel, what he says over here. He says, you know what this is linked to? There was a man whose name was Navot. Navot had a gorgeous field. Beautiful vineyard. And there was an evil king whose name was Achav, who was married to the wicked witch from the north, <laughs> Izevel. And this wicked woman who came from north of Israel, she's the original wicked witch of the north, she and her husband together did terrible things, persecuted people, guilty of murder, terrible people. And Achav, the king, decided he liked the vineyards of Navot. And he said to Navot, name your price. Before it was a television show. <laughs> Name your price. And what does Navot say? What does Navot say after Achav comes to him and he says, kesef, whatever it's going to be, you tell me. You tell me. I'll give you a better vineyard. What does Navot say? Chalilali. <laughs> Chalilali. <laughs> says Mitzudah's David, Chulin. This is a mundane way. This is sacrilege. How can I treat something sacred in a mundane, ordinary fashion? Sacrilege, he says. It's sacrilege, Bavur Mitzvah Hashem, because the Torah said, You're not allowed to sell your inheritance. You don't let go of the land that your parents gave you because God gave it to the Jewish people. Chalilali. Heaven forbid, he says, Are you kidding? I will give this away. This is my inheritance. So if a person feels connected to Torah because that's his alma mater, 
He went to school, he learned, this is my childhood. And then somebody comes along and says, I'll buy your childhood. Forget your childhood, it's time to progress and move into the next phase of civilization. Yeah, right. Modern up. Get with the newfangled times. Let go of that which is old and embrace the new. And you say, well, you know, this is my childhood. I say, yeah, you're not wearing your bar mitzvah suit anymore. Time to move on. Time to limber up. Come on, shake it up, Zadie, you know. Get with the times. So what's our response? Are you kidding? Khalila, this is our inheritance. It's not something I bought or acquired. It's an inheritance. An inheritance that was meant to be preserved for posterity. And that's, of course, our mission. To receive from previous generations and to pass on to the next. <laughs> There's a joke they tell. This little girl comes over to her mother and says, Mom, Mom. And mother says, yes, what's wrong? She says, you know that beautiful vase that for the flowers, you know, that, 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 that you inherited from your grandmother and that she got from her grandmother? It's like in our family for like six generations. And mother says, yes, yes, a beautiful, special vase, so special to me. So the little girl says, well, the next generation just dropped the inheritance. <laughs> That's our challenge, to make sure the next generation doesn't drop the vase. Don't shatter the inheritance. That's David Hamel's message. <laughs> <coughs> now we can understand the words of David Melech that ring so clearly and so beautifully. Nachalti, nachalti at Vesech, David Melech says, I take this personal, it's my inheritance, it's la'oilam, it's not something I inherited and will spend. This is the achuza, this is for eternity. That's what kind of inheritance this is. And that's why, or perhaps how, how can David and Melech be so sure that that which he inherited from his ancestors will be passed on to his future progeny? Ki sasen li behema, because I rejoice. And this is a key and very, very important detail in our Yiddishkeit, my dear friends. The point that's being made to us is that it has to be because of joy. It's only because of joy. As the Tehillah Hashem says, Im oisa adam besimcha, if you do the mitzvahs with joy, so then they can be passed on. But not if you do the mitzvahs in a way which is habitual. As the Sepharno says, he says, Natisi libi lasis chukecha. In the next verse he says, I turn my heart to do your mitzvahs. In verse 112, David Amalek talks about turning his heart. And the Radak says, turning my heart away from the pleasures and the libido of the sensual world, but instead turning my heart to the pleasures of Yiddishkeit. He says, how do you do that? He says, when mitzvahs are not habitual, when I'm not going through the motions, but I delight in what I'm doing. Ah, says the Tehillah Hashem. Indeed, when you delight in what you're doing, which means that you do it with joy. When you do it with joy, then, then the nat is passed on to the next generation. Then you merit to be able to bequeath this. And really, it's a natural phenomenon. It's not like almost a reward. It's what we call in Hebrew, a davar seguli. It's not a consequence per se as a punishment or reward, but a rather an organic or natural consequence. If your children see you enjoying your Yiddishkeit, then they too will follow in your path. As um, my father told me that he heard from Reb Moshe Feinstein's son, Reb Reuven, Fein, Reb Reuven Feinstein, Reb Moshe Feinstein used to say, he used to say that the problem with American Jews is that their parents came from Europe and they felt that the Yiddishkeit was laborious. And they said, and they used to, it's so hard to be a Yid. And the Meisha used to say, they forgot to say, it's delightful, it's delicious, it's wonderful to be a Yid. That's exactly what David HaMelech says according to Tehillah Hashem. He says, it'll be at Ve'isechalah <laughs> It will be an eternal inheritance. Kisos and Libi. When you find a sense of joy in it. Now here, I will share with you something very interesting. And um, first of all, the Maharam Arama says something fascinating. He says, how can it be personalized? How can it become actually yours? He says, that only happens when you study it. And the question is, is David Abel speaking only about the performance of mitzvahs or also about the study of Torah? And after all, Marosha Kilas Yaakov, first and foremost, refers to study. 
but he finishes with joy and mitzvahs. So Maharam says, when is it possible for a person to do mitzvahs with joy? When you study about the mitzvahs, when you know about the mitzvahs. Because when your mind and heart are able to absorb it first through study, and then it filters through the heart, then that is how you can experience joy. And this, of course, is really the essence of Chabad doctrine. When the Alter Rebbe said, it is necessary for every single Jew to study the deepest secrets of the Torah. For only when one is able to absorb the deepest mysteries of the Torah through their mind, Chabad, Chochma Bin Adas, the intellectual powers, only through that intellectual prowess, through acquiring the Torah, can it then later be distilled and filtered into the heart, which will naturally be expressed in action. Because when you feel fervently and passionately about it, you will always do it. So in other words, Zavad HaMelech is saying that it has to be joyous. But when he says it has to be joyous, that means it has to be studied. So actually, there is a statement which is made in Lakota Torah. I looked for it this morning, but I couldn't find it. I ran out of time looking. But I remember that in Lakota Torah, the Alter says, I think he says it on the words, V'yasisa Chag, Shavuos, or maybe in one of the other... Um, he says, you, you have, the Torah uses the word... So, so I think the Alter Rebbe there, I'm saying this from memory, but he says something to the effect of this, that when you learn about it, so then you acquire the Yom Tif. When you acquire the Yom Tif through study, then you can indeed, indeed experience the joy. That's like similar to what the Maharama Rama is saying on, on this Pasuk of Tilm, and that's <coughs> really the Shita of Chabad. Now before we move on to the next verse, I have to share with you a beautiful teaching from the Chida found in his Choymas Anoch. And he quotes the Sefer of Zerah Beirach. And he says, in the Sefer Zerah Beirach, he asks a question. And the question he asks is, that on one hand, we have this notion of schai, schar, pardon me, schar mitzvah, bahai al maleka. There's no reward for mitzvahs in this world. And on the other hand, we have the Pasuk that says, v'hoyo ekev tishmoun that you will come to pass, for Shomer Hashem Alekech God will give you, and we know that this is goodness, material goodness, because it speaks about rainfall in the land of Israel, and plentiful harvests, etc. Now really this question is asked by the Rambam, not on Vahoya Eik of Tishmo, and the Rambam asks this question on the words, Imbechu Kaisi Telechu, not on Deuteronomy, but on Leviticus. <coughs> and the Rambam's answer is that the rewards, the material rewards, are not actual rewards, but actual wherewithal. Do the mitzvahs, Hashem will give you the wherewithal to keep doing mitzvahs. And the only real reward is the mitzvah itself. But the, the Zer Beirach seems, I suppose, unsatisfied yet with this answer. And perhaps because the Torah repeats it, he feels that ultimately there is an element of actual reward, not just wherewithal to earn true reward, but there is an element of actual reward. And, and, and so he asks this question, how do you square that with the notion of schar, Reward Baha'i al Maleka. He says something fascinating. And the Chidor quotes us. He says, Guf ha mitzvah, the actual observance of the mitzvah, he says, Ein Shkaran Ba'ilam Haza. There's no reward for the actual body of the mitzvah in this world. But he says, the joy with which you perform the mitzvah, for this you do get rewarded, even in this world. Even in this world, he says. And that's the meaning of Hayyim la Asaisam. Today the main thing is to do them. But la Machar la Kabal Shkharan means Bahaya Ekev Tishmun. You will be rewarded tomorrow as long as you did it with Simcha. That's what he says. He says, Bavur Hasimcha, if you do it with joy, aha, then it'll be Bavur Hasimcha Az Vasham. Then Hashem will keep it for you. What you will soon see has a beautiful way of moving, its, moving itself into the next Pasuk. Of, of Tillam as well, and the commentary on Chaymas Anoch, which is known as Sfat HaChoma, or Edge of the Wall. He quotes Rabbeinu Nisim and Rabbeinu Dovan Hadnogid, and he says that they state clearly that a person who does mitzvahs for no particular reason, not because he's going to get something out of it, but rather out of love for Hashem, which means that you're doing it with joy. If you do it with joy, he says, you necessarily merit a reward in this world too. He says, Akeren Kayemet. The Mishnah says that there are mitzvahs for which there's reward in this world. 
And HaKeren Kayemet, the principle remains for the next world. He says, what does that mean? He suggests HaKeren Kayemet means the mitzvah itself. The principle means the mitzvah itself. That reward is in the next world. But the simcha with which you do the mitzvah, that brings you schar even in this world. And that's the meaning of Adam Ochom Perseum Beilam Hazer, that you're able to actually enjoy the fruits of it in the world to come. It's a very, very fascinating and interesting approach. Truth be told, the, appro- the uh, 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 general attitude and approach of Hasidus is that without Simcha, you cannot do a mitzvah in its entirety. That's what the Rebbe says very clearly in the chapters of Tanya, with, in which he deals with the pitfalls of depression and sadness. And he says, if you won't serve Hashem with joy, you won't, won't serve Hashem successfully. And it's uh, very interesting that the last of the 12 psukim, which the Rebbe ins- insisted everybody should me- memorize and ruminate on, the last of them is Yismach Yisrael Beis, of a quote from Tanya, which talks about joy in the service of God. And the way that I've explained it, the twelfth of the, of the steps is not a step at all, but rather it's what fills and elevates and, and, and transforms all of the steps. That all of the eleven steps prior must be done with Simcha. Because without Simcha, without joy, you're not going to be able to accomplish anything, at least not fully. The only way one can fully marshal and muster the wherewithal and abilities that HaKadosh Baruch has given us. The only way one can fully absorb and experience the, 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 the grand nature of Hashem's Torah and to discharge their mission in a successful way is if it's done with a sense of simcha, then with a sense of joy. <coughs> and this leads us now into the next Pasuk. Notisi libi, I have turned my heart, I already shared with you the interpretation of Radak, if my heart seems to gravitate towards worldly matters, notisi, I turn my heart, to do your statutes. Forever I will follow them. What does it mean, lo'olam ekev? So Rashi says, lo'olam ekev means al ma'agaloisam val nesivasam, on their pathways, on their roadways. I'll take this road. I'll keep turning off that road and going back onto the road of Torah and mitzvahs. In view of what we just talked about in the previous verse, verse 111, where there's a connection, a link between Ekev, Ahoyah Ekev Tishmu, and this makes a lot of sense. His point is, even the small little mitzvahs, right? Even the mitzvahs, because we know there's an, uh, a beautiful interpretation on the words, Ahoyah Ekev Tishmu, and actually the Tehillah Hashem connects this. He says, it says, what does Rashi say? Mitzvahs kales sha'adam dosh ba'akov, of the mitzvahs that people tend to step on. And he says, if you do those things, you turn away your heart even for those things, the mitzvah that people step on, then you will surely be able to maintain equilibrium. You'll follow the path. You will not veer off it. And it's not difficult to imagine that that's ultimately linked back to the concept of joy. Because if you rejoice in it, then you don't let the little details fall to the wayside, but rather you stay with the program. The Sefer Keflayim Leteshia says something very interesting about this. He says it's about footsteps, pathways, roadways. He says, he says something very important. One's growth in Yiddishkeit has to be measured. You have to continue to move forward. You cannot accomplish everything overnight. You cannot take the plunge. Transformation that comes overwhelmingly, invariably, will ebb away and dissipate. Transformation that is brought about slowly is ultimately able to be sustained and maintained. And he says that when David Amal talks about La'ilam Ekev, he says this means, what does it mean, La'ilam Ekev? It means tzad achat tzad, footstep upon footstep, detail upon detail, step by step, moving forward. Lobavat achat, not at, one, at once. And he says, when you're Oilam, Maila, Maila, Bimisinus. When a person deliberately continues to push the agenda of his or her Yiddishkeit forward, step by step, gradually, effectively, meaningfully, internalizing each step, and then moving on to the next. So then, Hamida Shom Chazaka, then you're solidly ensconced. Which really goes back to the essence of Chabad teaching, where the Altar says that personal transformation is the goal, but it's the long, short road that one must take. And the Altar bases the entirety of his Tanya on the notion that that all of Yiddishkeit is exceedingly close, 
But he says, what kind of close? This is a derech arucha ukitzara. It's a way which is long but short. This goes back to the Jerusalem Talmud that tells the story of a person who came to the city of Yerushalayim and somewhere outside of the city limits he meets one of those famous Yalde Yerushalayim, one of those famous children from Jerusalem and he says, Yingele, little boy, Yela, tell me what's the fastest way into the city? And the boy says, this way is the long but the short way, the other way is the short but the long way. And he says, what are your foolishness? Long but short, the short but long. I always heard that the children from Jerusalem are wise and yet you speak to me in riddles, in a forked tongue, foolishly. Just tell me, what's the fastest way? He says, well, I told you, that's the short but long way. What's the shortest way, exclaims the man angrily. He says, this is a very short way. You're only 100 yards from the city. Great, says the man. Thanks for nothing. And he begins to take the path. And all of a sudden, the pavement ends. And he ends up in boulders and rocks and obstacles and thorns and thistles. And he finally gets to the city and he's up against a brick wall. And he retraces his steps painfully. And he, then he takes the longer, short way. And he finds it perfectly paved straight through the city gates. Yeah. And Alter Rebbe says that's the derech, that's the way that he created to the system known as Chabad. Chabad Hasidus says you can change gradually, step by step. Learning the profundity of Torah, meditating, contemplating, internalizing its messages to the point that it stimulates and seeds your heart, developing your emotions in a healthy and lasting way, which lead to action. That is how personal transformation in a lasting and meaningful way has to be achieved. And once again, that's exactly what David Amalek is saying here, especially as the Kiflaim Letishia says, Natisi Libi, I turn my heart. All of Hasidus is about turning the heart, inclining oneself towards Yiddishkeit. And then it's La'olam Ekev. Then I'm able to step forward so that it becomes La'olam, that it indeed becomes a permanent thing. The Rich Yun seems to connect this idea to Chukim. He says, even the things which you don't really understand in our Yiddishkeit, even the things which are a chok, a statute, David Melech said, I was able to develop a taste for that too, and able to do it with joy. And therefore, because if you can develop a taste for things that your mind does not necessarily embrace naturally or organically, that your heart doesn't easily absorb, you have to turn your heart. You have to work at it. If you can do that with chukum, with the area of Torah that doesn't come naturally, then you know you're on a solid path and you're on the way to success. And therefore, David HaMelech says that it is this that will enable me, Natisi Libi, I turn my heart and in this fashion, La'oila Mekev, this becomes mine for eternity, for posterity. Hayitzhari says that David HaMelech was always watching his heart. And when he saw his heart was turning away, how did he redirect his heart? As we learned from the Maharama Rama through study, the Gemara says, what do you do if the Yetzirah comes your way? Pogabach Menuvel, the ugly one attacks you, what do you do? Mashkeu Lebeis HaMedesh. You send him into the house of Torah study. You study Torah. Drown him in the waters of Torah. And then you'll be freed from him. In other words, if you notice your heart is being turned away, what does Chassidus Chabad say? Study the profundity of the Torah. If you learn more chassidus, you'll enable you to kill your Sahara. And very interestingly, the word, the foundational sefer of chassidus is called Tanya. And it's noted that the word Tanya can be scrambled to spell the word Eitan, which means powerful or mighty. And the Alter Rebbe famously said that even Talmud Chachamim are afflicted with sometimes the might and power and force of a very strong Sahara. And what's the antidote? What can inhibit that strong, powerful Sahara? Limud chassidus. So the more we learn, the more we're able to turn things around to the point that our heart is transformed, which leads us into action all the way down into Okev, into the heel, into the footsteps in which we walk B'derech Ha'oila in the way that leads us towards Beis Hashem, towards the house and the permanence of Hashem's presence. The Me'iri puts it, he says, Natisi libi, Natisi is po'el yoitze. This is what will be engendered. This is what will naturally happen if a person will do what we just learned about. So then, when your heart will turn, you'll just turn. You just keep turning. Keep the path. Follow the course. And you'll see that in the end, everything works out 
and you do as HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to. And here we have the words of the Sepharno who says, you got to get your heart into this. It can't just be something which is done superficially like mitzvah hanashim elumada, not like commandments that are performed that have wrote habitually, but rather it has to be done le oilamekev le tachlas tachlis nitzri for an eternal purpose, and the eternal purpose is le ratzin lefnei Hashem to find favor in the eyes of Hashem. As the Sefer of Hayom Yom concludes on the last day of Erev Yutas Kislev, that the Alter Rebbe was heard saying that he doesn't want anything. Not your Gan Eden, not the Gan Eden Elyon, not Gan Eden The Alter Rebbe said, so what does he want? And he wants, based on the verse, uh, verses of Tehillim that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, that David HaMelech says, before HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Oy, what's the... Um, This is embarrassing. Yeah. I don't want anything but you. Not the earth, not the heavens, not the earth. Imcha, only the Abishter himself. In other words, to serve God for the purpose of serving God. And that's what David Amel says here is the ultimate purpose is noraz dichalein, the words of the Altar, but you alone. In other words, letachlis nitzchi, that the ultimate essence is that through the study of Torah and through the performance of mitzvahs, a yid is able to merit communion, closeness to Hashem. And when you become closer to Hashem, you become a natural conduit through which flows the presence of Hashem into our world, which fulfills the ultimate destiny, mission, and purpose of creation itself. Lasis le'izbarech dido betach to make Hashem a dwelling place here on planet Earth that Hashem's presence will seen and be known with the coming of Mashiach, Mehedah, over Yemenu, Amen. And with this we conclude the verses of Nun. And we are now poised to enter a new collection of Psukim in Mizmer Kofiotes.